tonight is, for the most part, a uh, dialogue between uh, Michael and Bernardo on topics that will include evolution, platonic realm, um, metacognition, boundaries of self, potentially uh, life and death, some new research that um, Michael has to talk about. Um, and then if there's time, often oftentimes there's less time for Q&A in the sessions where we have a guest, uh, then we'll do a Q&A for sure. Um, and then if there isn't time this week, then we obviously have Bernardo back for another, I think, three weeks before we have another guest. So, um, and Michael, you do quite a lot of, uh, are there other formats where people can follow your work where there's Q&A opportunity if someone's not in a kind of institution? Yeah, um, the closest is the is the blog. So people will often uh, e either either comment on, on specific blog posts or just email me questions. If they're good questions, I will eventually um, post the answers on the blog. So I'll do, um, I've got one scheduled, one set of Q&A scheduled for, I think next week from some stuff people sent me. So yeah, yeah, you can always- uh, yeah, uh, Like a live- a live Q and A or, or one that people write in. Uh, for now, it's been right, and I am actually going to schedule a live one. Um, that is something that I want to do. So I'm just figuring out some of the logistics, but I will. I will do that. Cool. Feel free to send us the details, and we'll send it out to this community as well. I'm sure people from here will join. Great idea. And also, um, yeah, just to tell everyone that I've been following this blog. Um, I'm not trained in science. Didn't even do biology. At high school <laughs> so, um, and I'm still able to follow the core ideas and you, you write it in such a fashion that um, someone without scientific training can follow so I really appreciate well, that thanks that's that's great yeah that's that was yeah. my hope that's great yeah uh, and I'm learning a lot and sometimes I use a bit of chat GPT to fill in some gaps hey guys, oh, I'm, uh, I'm a little late sorry about that cool welcome made me nervous there you. for a second <laughs> Have I ever let you down? <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Um, great. So welcome. How are you doing, Bernardo? Say it again. How are, how are you doing? Uh, I'm, I'm okay. Had a, a busy day so far. I'm still a bit uh, out of it. I have to take a, three deep breaths and, uh, and be here. Uh, I'm going to get there. Um, so potentially you can... Uh, relax and enjoy for the first few minutes. I was discussing with Michael earlier that maybe we could start on some of your thoughts, Michael, on evolution. Um, you mentioned a couple of papers or, or new research that you might want to mention. D does that feel good for you if you kind of discuss a little bit um, thoughts on evolution potentially into the platonic realm? Sure. Yeah, that's, yeah. that sounds fine. Yeah. Okay, cool. <clears throat> okay, well... Um... Let's see. So, uh, in in somewhat random uh, random order, um, there's a couple of a uh, couple of interesting things that have uh, come out of our lab recently. Um, one has to do with this uh, notion of hyper embryos, and uh, what we were looking at is uh, horizontal information transfer between embryogenesis. Nor normally, normally you get this idea that you've got an embryo and the reason that that embryo is able to complete its journey from being a single cell to being a, a complex organism is because of its uh, genome and the maternal proteins that are in the egg. And so it's kind of vertical, right? It's all this stuff that's handed down by the, by the mother. And so one of the interesting things that we discovered, and this was, uh, this was led by a PhD student in my group, Angela Tung. And what we found is, is something really interesting that when you challenge a collection of embryos with some kind of teratogen, a teratogen is anything that tends to disrupt their ability to complete development normally. So this could be a drug, it could be an, a genetic change, it could be a, a, a vibration, the, it could be all, all kinds of things. So it turns out that um, when you challenge them with something like this, it turns out that large groups of embryos do much better at resisting it than small groups. And when we studied it, we found out that uh, not only is there kind of like this 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 group effect, but also it is uh, not sufficient to have a group that's made up of some individuals that never got challenged in the first place. And what the reason the reason this is important is this: our our initial very simple model for what's going on. Why why would large groups of embryos develop better than than small groups? Uh, initially, you might think that well, what's happening is that. If everybody's getting uh, affected by some kind of uh, uh, perturbation, 
than by the sort of by the by the kind of group um, group collective intelligence idea that everybody has uh, some gaps in their knowledge of how to make an embryo, but everybody's gaps are in a different place. And so as long as they all exchange information, then everybody can have all the information they need, right? That's a very simple way to think about it. It's the way they, they used to do this thing where people would um, guess the number of jelly beans in a jar in a, in a store, right? And, and no individual person was ever close, but the group actually, if you average the group, they were always, you know, spot on. So, so, so we knew like the wisdom of the crowd kind of thing so so initially we thought that was it but if uh, if that was it then what you could do is you could you could make a large group that's composed of a bunch of embryos that were uh, exposed to the uh, stressor and then a bunch of embryos that were never exposed and those would have all the information they need and that should be even better right because they could then instruct all the others because they're not stressed out they would have all the all the information it turns out that doesn't actually work. It the only uh, individuals that can help the group do better is ones that have been exposed to the stressor themselves. It's kind of this weird thing. Like Mark, Mark Solms told me once that in psychoanalysis, you know, in order to do psychoanalysis, you have to have been yourself psychoanalyzed, right? It's this kind of like participatory thing. So it's 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 kind of interesting that that you can only help if you've already seen that stressor. And then we use some tools to actually see the embryos communicate with each other. It's pretty wild. You can actually see waves of, uh, of, of information uh, bo born by ATP and calcium signaling and some other things that are that sort of propagate across the, across the collective. And it, it has a couple of implications. One implication it has is that uh, lots of prior studies that looked at the toxicity or, or of, of various compounds but didn't actually look at, uh, well, how many embryos did we expose at one time, right? All these studies use different numbers of, you know, zebra fish and, and tadpoles and so on. Um, all of those numbers are actually not correct. What you're getting is not an assessment of how dangerous is that compound. What you're getting is an assessment after it's been corrected for by the group. So what you're not seeing the raw effect, you're seeing the whatever effect is left over after the group has done its, its repair, repair functions. And and so, and so this is, this is, this is uh, very important because uh, what it suggests is that the information that's needed to be, to, to have very stable development is not just vertical. It's not just something that every embryo has everything they, they need and all of that. It's actually a, a, a kind of a group construction project. And not only functionally does the group do better than uh, the large group do better than the small group or individuals. We looked at uh, gene expression and we asked what novel genes do large groups express that small groups and individuals don't express. And there's a huge collection of, of new genes that they turn on, which suggests that this idea that uh, normally in developmental biology, what you're studying is the way individual cells help each other and, and cooperate and compete. And then, and then you get this nice, nice embryo as a result. You can take that one level higher and say that, okay, so that's embryogenesis, but there's a kind of hyper embryo, which is the large group, which has its own dynamics, which it can actually complete the journey better. And we can see the communication between its parts, between the embryos, and it has its own transcriptome. The large, this, this hyper embryo actually has its own set of gene expressions that, um, that, it's, that otherwise uh, its parts wouldn't have. So it's it's a really interesting example. You know, we study a lot the collective intelligence of individual cells and how it uh, scales up to be this this amazing uh, morphogenetic uh, system that can um, create anatomies and repair them and so on. But I guess it goes one step further. It's actually the individuals are talking to each other too, and you can imagine from that you can imagine some um, therapeutic applications because what if you could uh, what if you could uh, fake the effect. Right. So what if in the therapeutic context, what, once, once we understand what it is that they're saying to each other, we could uh, possibly uh, we could possibly um, uh, impose that artificially in, in therapeutic context, whatever that whatever the signals, uh, you know, whatever the signals are. So um, we're in the process of trying to understand uh, wh what, wh what the communication is like, what are they saying to each other? Really, it's quite a puzzle because the information that you need to actually create a complex embryo is there's a lot of information. It's unlikely that all of that information can be propagated by something as simple as a signal, um, a, a, a single, um, uh, uh, let's say, a level of ATP or something, whatever the, whatever the molecules are going to end up being. They, so they must be modulated somehow. It's it's really interesting to ask how are they actually communicating and what are they what are they actually saying to each other. So um, yeah, and and then and then just this notion of you know the fact that 
yes, uh, you've got individual genomes that do their, their job within individual embryos, but, but the magic of morphogenesis and that collective intelligence doesn't stop at the border of the individual. It actually uh, is able to uh, use the computational power of the large collective. So that's, you know, that's, that's, that's one of the things um, that, that we did recently. Anybody, uh, any, any questions or comments about that? Um, Uh, someone asked horizontal gene expression, like in mycelium. So, uh, just someone just been reading entangled lives. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yes and no, right? It, it, yes, in the sense that what the genes that one embryo express are going to affect the genes that near that that others in the group express. But we don't think we haven't exclude you know uh, con conclusively ruled it out. But we don't think it's that it's literally propagating the material, like it's like, we don't think it's propagating uh, uh, transcription factors or anything like that. I think what's happening in this, this issue will come up again when we talk about um, some, some new thoughts we had on memory, um, that what it's doing is basically compressing a large amount of information into a very narrow communications channel. So something that can be easily encoded by small molecules that are propagating. And then the recipient embryos have to sort of re-inflate re or reinterpret it for their own, for their own context. I have a feeling that's what's going on, but but yeah, in in, a, in effect, what you're seeing is 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 a horizontal uh, transfer of information that that ends up controlling gene expression. So, just a super naive question. So, you've got an embryo that will do something specific on its own, and then it behaves differently if it's surrounded by lots of other embryos. Um, so, with a human, I'd just be like, okay, well, human can count. I'd be like, great, there's lots of people around me. You know, I'll, I'll copy what they're doing, but. Um, is it just passively receiving it from it? Because presumably you don't think they're metacognitively counting how many embryos are around them. How does the question I, make sense? Yes, 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 it does. Uh, I don't have any evidence that uh, that they're aware that they're counting for sure. I'm not claiming that. Uh, but I think that what's happening is, and, and we actually in the paper, I mean, uh, you know, uh, if anybody's interested in the in the details of the computational stuff, we actually have in the paper a model of cellular automata. Uh, acting this way, that that is a noisy cellular automata where each one has a problem figure following a specific set of rules, but uh, but there's a large collective and they get to communicate and eventually you get pretty robust communication in the group. So no, I don't think they're explicitly counting, but I think by virtue of the mechanisms that that couple them together, you in effect get something that is quite sensitive to uh, the number of, of of individuals in your in your cohort. And then now, and at any point, obviously, Bernardo, just feel free to comment or speculate if, if um, something Mike was saying sparks an interest. Um, and is what you just said related to that blog that you put that was talking about a paper um, around the surprising emergent behavior of um, algorithms? Um, the algorithms, uh, well, well they, I, I mean, I do think I do think that all of these things are connected in interesting ways. The algorithms were a different paper. So uh, what we did there, if if uh, if people want to talk about that, what we did there was, uh, you know, one of the one of the things about biology is that when you look at systems, no matter how simple you think it is, you know, even if it's uh, some kind of a you know a microbe or something, there's always more mechanism. There's always more uh, different components and different amazing things that you didn't know were there, and so that that makes it kind of hard to really study. Um, emergent surprising outcomes because someone could say, well, there's probably a mechanism specifically for that. You just haven't found it yet, right? So what we wanted to do was to um, really come up with a system that is extremely minimal, extremely transparent, where there was no place to hide, where it was obvious what all the parts were, and then use all the tools of the frameworks we've been developing to ask, okay, well, is there some kind of emergent uh, 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 protocognitive capacity here. And what we chose were very simple uh, things called sorting algorithms. So um, for anybody who, who doesn't do computer science in the audience, what these are are very simple sets of steps. There's usually, the whole algorithm is usually six or seven lines of code. It's very simple. And what it's designed to do is to take a, an array of uh, numbers that are jumbled up. So it's an array of integers, let's say a hundred of them, and they're jumbled up in random order. And there's an algorithm, which is a set of steps that will, uh, if you follow it uh, consistently, it, what it will eventually do is sort the whole list into, let's say, ascending or descending order. These are things that uh, computer scientists have been studying for, for decades. Every computer science student starts out you know, learning these things. And, and the thing about them is that uh, they are um, 
extremely, uh, they're, they're simple, they're short, they're transparent, you can see all the parts, there is no more mechanism to be discovered, uh, and they're completely deterministic. So, and, and, and people think they know what these things do, right? So you think, you know, you, you, we, we've, we've studied them. And so, and so what we wanted to do was to ask uh, the question of uh, what, what surprising behaviors could be hiding even in something as simple as this, you know, and it's important because oftentimes, uh, for example, people who do um, AI and, and things like that, you know, I had said, somebody said to me recently, ah, there's no, there's no emergent behavior in language models. I know how they're built. I, you know, I know what all the parts are. And and I, I th you know I think I think this is a this is a very uh, very dangerous attitude, and so and so we wanted to to kind of study this uh, this very simple system, and so so what we did there was we visualized the process of of um, to, to a couple of a couple of uh, interesting twists. One is that we we visualized the process of sorting these numbers as a uh, as a walk through. Uh, through what we call sortedness space. So they start out in a region of that space where completely jumbled, but everybody eventually gets to this place over here where everybody's in order and they have to sort of, during the, during the sorting, that string sort of makes its way to, the, uh, to that spot. And what we did was we said, okay, instead of having one sort of omniscient algorithm that gets to move around all the pieces, which is normally what happens, there's an algorithm that moves around all the, um, all the parts. What we did was we put the algorithm inside the cells themselves. This again will be important when we later talk about the memories because what we basically did, made was self-sorting arrays. So what we said is each number, it on its own has the ability to look to its left and to its right and decide uh, how happy it is about where it is. And if it's not happy, so if I'm a five, I want the four to my left and the six to my right. And if I don't see that, I'm, I, I wanna move somewhere else where I'm gonna be happier. That, 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 that's it, there is no, there is no global, um, there is no global uh, uh, control. And so, uh, what we found when, when you do that, a couple of interesting things happen. First thing that happens is that um, it still works, you know, so, so when, you, uh, when, when you do this and you have this, this like self-sorting data where, where you're erasing a little bit the distinction between the algorithm and the data, because now the data itself has a, has, has a little bit of act, uh, action, uh, action to it. Um, what happens is, yeah, they still, they still, they, they still sort, but, but uh, now you can do two, two interesting things. One thing you can do is you can make some broken cells. So you can ask, what happens if some of the cells are broken? They can be broken in one of two ways. Either they uh, refuse to move when they are asked to move, or they're completely broken in that they don't even try to move. They're not just broken for, for others, but, but you know, they won't swap with others, but also they don't, they don't initiate. So they're just completely frozen in place. Normally in these algorithms, you assume that the hardware is reliable uh, that is, if the algorithm says swap the four and the seven, they swap and you never even go back to check, well, did it work? Like, was it swapped or not? You know, you normally don't check. This again will come up as, as important. Um, the, the, the importance of unreliable hardware, I think in biology and, 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 and cognition is, is really critical. Um, so, we, we, so we made this, uh, this kind of uh, unreliable um, uh, hardware example where they're sorting and eventually you get to uh, some numbers that will not move, they're frozen. And that turns out to be a barrier in their journey towards being sorted. It's like what, um, what uh, the, you know, the, the, the definition of, of intelligence I like, which is, you know, the ability to get your goals met despite all kinds of novel circumstances, perturbations, the ability to basically to navigate your, your space and get your goals met. So these algorithms, just to be clear, there is no code in there about what happens if the number doesn't move. How am I doing? Did the number move? Uh, nothing like that in there. The algorithm stays exactly the same. But what does it do when you do inter when you do uh, interrupt its journey with these barriers that cannot be passed? Um, William James had this uh, had this 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 notion of of navigating barriers and so on. And there's a concept of delayed gratification. The deal with delayed gratification is that when you come to a barrier. If if uh, if if you're if you're a magnet and and you want to there's two magnets and they try to come together you put a piece of wood between them. The magnets, all they're ever going to do is stay there stuck between the wood. The magnet is never going to go around to, to get to its goal because that because it has no delayed gratification. It would have to go further from its goal in order to get to where it's going. Magnets don't do that, but some animals do, some autonomous vehicles do, and so on. Uh, what do these algorithms do? So it turns out that without any special code for it, what the algorithms will do if you actually track the sorting. So, so here it moves along, moves along. It's sorting everything. It meets the barrier. Uh, when it meets the barrier, it actually it, it actually goes around, and in order to go around, the array actually gets less sorted over time. It has a degree of delayed gratification. The, the whole thing gets worse for a little while until it moves all the other numbers around that broken cell, and then things improve. So it has the ability to 
and temporarily gets further away from its goal. And it only does this when it encounters a broken, uh, you know, broken cell. But but it has the it has this this really like primitive, but but already a tiny capacity for delayed gratification that is completely emergent. It is nowhere in the algorithm for it to do that. We had no idea this this uh, this was going to do that. Um, and uh, and so 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 just just a couple of things, and I'd love to I'd love to hear what what Bernardo has to say about it. Uh, one thing is this 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 little bit of delayed gratification, and then and then there's another, there was another thing that we found, because we've now put the algorithm inside the cells themselves, that lets you do something weird. It lets you create a chimeric array where some of the cells are following one sorting algorithm, let's say bubble sort, the other ones are following a different algorithm, let's say selection sort or something. Okay, so, so it's like a chimera. We make, we make this in the lab all the time. You know, we'll do, um, we'll make a, 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 like a, like a, a frog allotl, which has a bunch of uh, frog embryonic cells with some axolotl embryonic cells. And each of them are following different algorithms. You put them together and you ask, what does this collective make? Okay, when different parts are, are, are constructing things under different rules, what, what's going to be the outcome? So we can make these chimeric strings. We can make these algorithms where the different cells are following different rules. And then we found something really wild, uh, which, is, which is this, that uh, imagine, imagine that you assign, uh, we, we called it, actually, this was uh, Adam Goldstein uh, came up with this idea. He called it the algotype, you know, genotype, phenotype. So this is the algotype. The algotype is the, the algorithm that any cell happens to be following. Um, at the beginning, so you've got your array of 100 numbers, and it's, it's random. The numbers are randomly uh, distributed, and they are randomly assigned to algo types. There's two, two, different, two different algorithms randomly assigned. When you do this, um, let's, let's, just, let's just ask, uh, what, what are the, what, what are the, what's the probability that when I look at my neighbor, my neighbor is the same algo type as me? At the beginning, it's 50% because they're random. So your neighbor has a 50% shot of being the same type of, uh, the same type of cell as you are. At the end, after all the sorting is done, same thing. It's also going to be 50% because the algorithm doesn't care about algotype at all. There is nothing in the algorithm that says, what algorithm am I? What algorithm is my neighbor? There's nothing in there about that. At the end, everybody's got to get sorted according to their integer value, which means the algotypes, again, are shuffled and, and random. So 50% at the beginning, 50% at the end. But what happens in the middle? If you track what happens in the middle, what happens in the middle is the that that uh, we we call it the clustering this idea of this 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 measure of how how what's the probability that i like to hang out with my name with my buddies there's the same type of things as as, as i am the same algorithm it, it actually goes like this so so in the middle it goes up um and then it and then it comes down again so for the for the mm -hmm. and and it, it's it's this uh it's this amazing uh emergent tendency for these guys to cluster during their journey and it's sort of it's um, to to me it all it's um it's it's all it almost reflects like the uh, the you know the existential uh, condition of of life in a in the universe like eventually the physics of the world you have to obey the physics of the world and eventually they're going to pull you apart but in the meantime uh, even though it's not prescribed by the rules that you're following you get to do something interesting something new and interesting and maintain a pattern at a high level you get to make these um, these clusters these these temporary uh, t t temporary um, emergent uh, uh, patterns of uh, of of like uh, like minded uh, uh, like minded data that are that are sitting there. Eventually, they're going to get pulled apart. But in the meantime, they're there. And you know, we did we did some other things. Like we said, um, how, what what happens if we relieve the pressure a little bit of getting pulled apart? How, how you know, g give them a little more opportunity to do what they really want, which is to cluster. And the way you can do that is you can allow duplicate numbers. You can say, okay, we'll have 10 fives and 10 sixes and 10 sevens. And that way you can sort of have your cake and eat it too. You can be a bunch of fives in the right place, but the, but, but the first few fives can be one algo type and the next few can be in the, and if you do that, they cluster even more. So you can see that the pressure to cluster is quite significant. They just get pulled apart at the end. So um, I'll just stop here. But the, but the point of the point of that whole, that whole, uh, that whole journey is to just start to look at these extremely simple, transparent, deterministic systems and already find interesting um, capabilities. And, and, and now, I mean, there's some practical stuff to be done here too, because they're, they're doing this clustering for free, basically, right? We're not, you know, it doesn't require any additional computational power. So if that happened to be something useful, or if we coupled it to something useful, you could imagine getting some more, squeezing some more, um, some more juice out of, of a process that's already happening anyway. So anyway, I'll stop here and see what, uh, see what 
Bernardo has to say. I, I... Is it okay, Bernardo, to just quickly see if a simple example will help anyone that, because I've read it, so I think I'm following you, Michael, but um, it is a simple illustration of this is uh, normally a sorting rhythm, let's say I've got a classroom full of, a school full of children, and I want them all lined up in terms of height. And normally the teacher would stand there and be like, okay, you stand there, you stand there, you stand there, and, and kind of sorts it from a bird's eye view. And what you've done is told each child, if the one on the right of you is you taller than you, swap sides, or if it's shorter than you, go further that way. And so you've given instructions to each child to move. Is that close to what you've... Yeah, that's that's close. And so so to following that that analogy, you you've told them to sort by height, and eventually they do sort by height. But what you notice is that halfway through, they also seem to be clustering by eye color. So they're, for, some, for some reason, they're also hanging out together by some other um, property that, that your instructions to them do not reference at all, right? So there's some other, there's some other property that they seem to, uh, you know, they, they, that they seem to want to um, uh, uh, group up by. And then eventually, of course, they'll, they'll sort out by height and there's no necessary relationship between height and eye color. So eventually it'll go away. But in the meantime, you notice that, hey, there are these, there are these groups of, of, of similarly um, eye colored individuals. Great. And also each child can only see the one right next to them. Is, is that how it's set up? That they can't uh, there's see? A few, oh. There's a few different, I mean, we use a few different versions of this with different ability, you know, different radius that, that they can see and so on. All right. Sorry, Bernardo, go for it. Um, I, I'll invite you. I, I love your work, Michael, but here I depart from you. So I, I'll invite you to sort of um, come into my thought line on this. Um, you, of course, know Conway's game of life, cellular yep. automaton. There's array of, an array of very simple cells, and each cell obeys only essentially one rule. Um, if there are two or three of my neighbors who are alive, then I either stay alive or I become alive. Otherwise, either I stay dead or I die. That's it. That's all there is. Each cell counts how many neighbors are alive and decides whether it's alive or dead in the next cycle. That's all there is to it. And then if you let that thing play out and you see the patterns that the living cells, the cells that are alive, the patterns they form, we see amazing things. We see cannons firing projectiles. With, we see systems that seem to be swallowing up other systems and growing as they do that. It, it, that's why it's called the game of life, because we see all these patterns. But would you concur with me that ontically, there is only that simple rule? Everything else is an epistemic projection of us. Yeah, that, so that, that's, a, that's a super interesting and important point. So I, I do agree that everything that we just mentioned, uh, the gliders, the, the beehives, all, all of this other stuff, it is, it is absolutely a, a pattern uh, noticed by an observer, in this case, us. But my point is going to be that I think the same thing is true of many agents in biology. In other words, I think that that observing a temporary um, uh, temporary uh, of physiological object, which is what I think gliders are, right? They're a pattern that moves through an excitable medium. I think that in many ways, uh, these kinds of things, this is exactly what life, what, that, that's, a, that's a reasonable way to look at life forms, to look at stress patterns moving through tissues, to look at uh, you know, genomic information propagating through a lineage agent. I, I, I agree with you, but I think it's actually important. And um, you know, Randy Beard did this, this cool paper called um, uh, the, uh, the, what do you call it? The cognitive domain of a glider in the game of life. Like he, he literally tried to take the perspective of the glider and say, what do you see if you're a glider, you know, from the perspective of the glider. And I think, I, I think, yeah, I, I, right. I think, I think it's a projection of other cognitive systems. And, and I think that's a great way to look at a lot of things in biology, actually. I, I don't have a problem with that. I think complexity science <clears throat> has, has been showing us very, very compellingly that things that we consider to be very complex, in fact, aren't complex at all, at all ontically. The complexity is our own projection of our own cognitive modes onto the behavior of that thing. That thing is probably just playing out very simple rules like the, like the game of life. I, I completely agree with that. I'm, I'm, as you know, I am an extreme reductionist. It's just that I don't try to reduce the big to the small. I try to reduce the complex to the simple. And, and, and I think that's the correct way to reduce things. But uh, 
in the title of your paper, in, in the title of your paper, you start by saying what to do algorith algorithms want. So instead of saying, look, these high level functions that we seem to see, they may not be there at all. They may be our own epistemic projections. The title of your paper suggests that you're doing the opposite. You are imbuing a system made of very simple rules with the kind of cognitive modes that only complex organisms have, like a, a delayed reward. Well, why do I delay my reward? Because I know I have, I have an inner model that gives me a projection of the future state. Um, but that's not what your, your numbers are doing. They do not have an inner model that allows us to anticipate a possible future state to deliberately delay their reward. The, 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 the delayed reward thing is purely an epistemic projection of ours. It's not in the system, but it is in me because I have the model, I experience it, I, I, I can anticipate future states and deliberately delay reward uh, for that. So yeah, that, that, that's where I get slightly uncomfortable because you, you present this not as eliminating the notion that there are these higher level cognitive things going on, you present it as if you were imbuing things that are very simple and mechanic with these higher level cognitive functions. So yeah. it's, it's a slight criticism. I, did, I, I do it open heartedly, uh, uh, Michael. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no, it's great. This is this is exactly the conversation to have, and I think I think these are valid valid points. And and uh, uh, here's here's my my view on it. A couple of things. First of all, um, this idea of epistemic projections, I think yes, I, I agree with you, and and I think that it's everywhere. In other words, um, when you look at so so let's look at let's look at an embryo. Um, Basically, basically, for all of these scenarios, I think there are multiple perspectives, multiple points of view that an observer could take. And you could absolutely take the bottom uh, uh, perspective, so to speak, and say, okay, look, in the game of life, there are no gliders, there are no beehives, all there is, is individual fixed cells, nothing moves, there are individual fixed cells. It, it, it matters, though, I'm, I'm, what's interesting to me is that these different perspectives, you know, it, it's often argued that these different perspectives are a philosophical um, choice, you know, they're all as good as each other. And you can you can look at it from the bottom, you can look at it some other way. I, I, I think it actually makes a huge difference. Because, you know, I, I'm sure you've seen some somebody made a, um, a, a Turing machine in the game of life using the gliders as, as signal pulses, right? So if you don't believe in gliders, if if all you do is if all you believe in is the is the low level um, uh, uh, rules that that govern each uh, each each cell, you can absolutely explain any events in the world. And in fact, you can predict forward what's going to happen in that world. You can roll it forward as much as you want. What you're not going to do is build a Turing machine out of gliders, right? It's 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 you know what you 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 can you can make predictions from a system that's already set up. If somebody makes a, a starting position, you can certainly say everything that's going to happen about that. But 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 I think that level of description um, limits uh, the ge the generative insight that you have into what can happen, and it becomes really important in in the in the biology that we study. For example, so as you, as as you said, there are simple rules. So so we we look at an embryo. We look at an embryonic blastoderm. There are fifty thousand cells, and uh, somebody will say Something there else. is no embryo here. There are just individual uh, chemical reactions. They're following their, their rules. There, there is no embryo here. And certainly there isn't any goal state. There isn't any. Uh, what I would say is this. You can, you can have that view. But what you're going to miss there is the fact that all of the cells in that embryo, uh, the reason that the, what, what we're counting when we say one embryo, what we're counting is um, the commitment of all of those cells to a particular uh, target in that anatomical space that they are all going to reach. And the reason that I call it a goal and a target is because functionally, if you try to deviate them from that target, you can move things around, you can put barriers, you can do all this stuff, they will find clever ways to uh, to to still get there. Now, I'm not saying that this is a metacognitive goal the way that humans have goals and that you can reason about your goals, you can set new goals. I'm not claiming that, right? There's a, there's a continuum, of course, there's a very basic you know, there's a very kind of uh, basal version of this, but I think that I think that perspectives that uh, look at the system and acknowledge that okay, there's a perspective in which uh, none of this is happening. There's another perspective in which that that is happening. 
it leads you to new experiments. I mean, many of the things that we've done, we've only been able to do precisely because we take seriously the idea that, that yes, this is a system that in some way uh, has, has the ability to correct towards a specific outcome. And so with respect to these algorithms, I mean, you're right in that, by the way, the paper itself, if you, if you look at the, the paper itself was not titled, what do they want, right? The paper had a very um, much more uh, sort of conventional title. Yeah, the, academic, blog. Yeah, the, yeah. The, the blog post is, is titled that because, you know, that's where I sort of say, say, say what, I, what I think. But, um, you know, talking to Carl Friston about it, we, we really talked about the testing. And this is, a, this is an empirical question. I don't know if this happens or not, but one of the thing, one of the ways you can look at as to why they cluster is uh, is is the um, a tendency to minimize uncertainty. So so your neighbor, the the least uncertain neighbor, is the one that's just like you, right? So 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 possibly you can use the active inference framework to describe why it is that they have a, a pressure to cluster together with other beings that are like them, and that's this comes up in biology too. So these are all experiments that we can do, but I would say that. I, I think we're both right in the sense that there is absolutely a perspective to be taken here in which there are only low level rules, but there are other perspectives on this, which, uh, which, which, which may be useful, you know, in terms of finding new discoveries, making new things. And, and, and then I guess my final thing is that I think everything is a perspective of some agent, you know, everything, not just, not, not just, you know, some, some things, but all, all of it, everything. I, I concur with you that it is operationally useful to think at different levels of abstraction. So if you're going to build a computer, if you're going to build a Turing machine with the Conway's game, game of Life, then it's very useful to operate at a higher level of abstraction mm -hmm. where you're dealing with higher level components. Otherwise, you would just be uh, you know, overwhelmed with uh, a detail. Um, that is operationally useful. Um, but But... At the end of the day, it's a cultural game, right? I mean, I am uh, on the record very publicly uh, saying that uh, you are doing the most important work in the world right now. And um, and people have come to me and say, oh, look, Michael uh, thinks algorithms want stuff. Algorithms have will. So, uh, so AI is sentient. And you are saying, you know, on a crusade, saying that we have no reason to think that AI is sentient. And... Where does that come from? It, it comes from this epistemic projection of word usage, how we talk about things. Um, you, you started your discussion today talking about, uh, you know, AI people saying, you know, there is nothing to these large language models that we don't understand. I am one of those people who say that. I, I, I understand the mechanics of that. I know what is there and what is not. Um, so the, the, the fight we are fighting is to prevent this operationally useful levels of abstractions. In other words, these convenient fantasies, which are very, very convenient and should be used, we are trying to prevent people from understanding this epistemic thing as if it were an actual ontic property of the world out there, because that's what Black Mirror does, that's what the 8 o'clock news does, that's what the very suspicious characters on the internet and on YouTube um, are doing. There is money uh, to be made uh, out of this. And um, yeah, and then uh, Anyway, I, I have a, a slight issue <laughs> with yeah. this, but I, I do understand your point that it is operationally useful. But I think we should try to stress um, that there is a distinction between epistemic convenient fictions and ontic things about the world. That uh, when we say that we are using an epistemic convenient fiction here, we don't mean by it that the algorithm has a will, that it has uh, the phenomenal state of wanting to get, you know, some teleological phenomenal state. We don't necessarily mean that. Yeah. I mean, so so I'll, I'll, I'll kind of emphasize the part that we completely agree on. My, my point about the language models was not that uh, I think that they have, uh, and I don't use the word sentience much myself, but but the kind of sentience that, that people often attribute to them. I mean, I, I, I don't think they have it. But but I think I think the the kind of the fundamental thing where um, that drives our, our our viewpoints here is that uh, are the difference in our viewpoints is that I don't really believe in a binary distinction between yes they have it or no they don't have it right I I think it's a deep spectrum and I think that what's really interesting and important about the universe is uh, that it's full of what what I what I what I really think is is sort of um, uh, competing and, and, and acting in the universe is, is perspectives, frames of reference. And, the, and, and, you know, I think very simple systems 
can have a perspective. I think it makes sense. It, it could be it could be extremely tiny. I don't you know, I, I just I don't like the mm, the binary trying to classify systems that, OK, this is this this really has an inner point of view and this absolutely does not. I, I, th I think it's a continuum. And I think the question is, uh, how much, you, you know, how much uh, utility do you get from taking the perspective of some other some other system? And some of them are truly minimal. I, I, I don't you know, these things that we're talking about now, I, I don't think they're metacognitive. I don't think they're anything like a, like a human. But I do think that there's a sense of a nano, um, you know, a, a set of uh, a, a sense of a kind of a, a a nano goal directedness that we can uh, that we can have, and and the problem is the problem is is that if we don't believe that's true, then we're going to have a real uh, difficulty saying why it is that humans or whatever else did you want to extend it to why they have it too, right? Because we all start life as a single cell, and somehow you have to get to the point where you're a little blob, you start out as a little blob of chemistry and physics, and eventually you end up with whatever it is that you and I have, you know, real, real metacognitive um, wants and goals and things like that. And I'm not saying there isn't a difference between those two cases, there certainly is, but the hard part is, is explaining that smooth transition, you know, and this is, yeah, this is, this is what we work on. Is it okay, Bernardo, before you respond, and I, I would love for you to respond, if, uh, one or both of you could state as in simple terms as possible what it is you're debating, so as many people as possible can follow. Because I, I, I'm pretty sure I understand, but I don't think I'd be able to articulate it. it, it it's basically what is a thing. Well, it, it, what is an emergent property? I think that, that is the discussion. Uh, when you talk about emergency in, in a weak manner, so not strong emergency, not consciousness out of non-consciousness, just emergence like... Um, the shape of sun dunes or the crystal structure of a, a snowflake emergence in that sense in which a simple a, a, a system starts with very simple properties but it seems to develop some very complex properties or some complex uh, uh, behaviors uh, later on the question is are emergent behaviors a thing a nontic thing in the world up there does something actually emerge in the world or is it just us that project the modes of our cognition and what's happening and what's happening is just simple stuff. There is nothing complex emerging. It's just the play out of simple rules in an iterative way. And we project something to it. And, and Michael, we both agreed that uh, that uh, there isn't something ontic going on uh, out there, I, I, if I understood Michael. But Michael says it's useful in our own language, in our own thinking, in our own inner discourse uh, to pretend that there is because it allows us to think in a higher level of abstraction, which is much easier than to continue to operate on, operate on first principles all the way along. It's like somebody asking me to design a risk processor starting from the PN junctions. It's not useful. I need to think in terms of gates or at least transistors, you know. And are there transistors in a chip? No, there are only PN and NP junctions. That's all there is to it. Uh, doped silicon and metal, that's all there is to it. But it's useful for me to do my work, to talk of transistors, to talk of gates, to talk of, uh, of chips and interconnect networks. And if I understood Michael, that's, that's, that's where he's coming from. But he also thinks that uh, we shouldn't go too strong in this radical division between emergence being purely epistemic, not being out there in the world, and what is really out there in the world, because he thinks... The idea of points of view may be a sort of a, a, a um, not a binary one, because if it were binary, we would have difficulty in con starting from uh, a zygote, a single cell, a single cell embryo. Can you even call that an embryo? Uh, I think we can. Uh, to us, we, who do have a point of view. So, how do you explain explain that transition? I think was Michael's last point. Uh, is, is this fair enough, uh, Michael? I, I think it's reasonable. Well, the second part is 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 straight on. the The first part, I, I think, I want to be a little more radical than this. Um, so let's let's play it out and see see how see how it goes. Uh, how about this? Um, I I one hundred percent agree with you that all of these things. And by the way, it's not just emergence. I'm not I'm not particularly impressed by the emergent complexity per se. I'm interested in emerging emergent goal directedness, which is different than than just complexity. But uh, I I fully agree with you that all of those things are. Uh, painted on to the world by us. They are things that we see in the world. Here's, here's the move I want to make. When you say us, I think it's everything. 
I think that us is not just us, me and you. I think that every agent in the world, and we, you know, at some point we could talk about wh where that bottoms out, but uh, I think it, what, what, what certainly what happens in biology is systems that try to understand other systems because they need to hack them. And in order to hack them, you don't want to always try to think of them as the lowest level of a bunch of emergent um, complex uh, chemical soups that are going to happen. If these are, if these other systems have any kind of uh, goal directedness, and I don't mean human purpose, I mean the kind of things you study in cybernetics, so very, you know, and, and everything in between, right? All all of these other high level features, you will paint it onto the world, uh, uh, because it because it this is how you are going to relate to the world. You do not have as a, as an agent in this universe, you don't have the luxury of being a Laplacian demon and uh, you know sort of having an unbiased view of the whole world from the particles up. You have to coarse grain it in and sense making in a way that makes sense to you. And inevitably, you're going to tell agential stories about uh, uh, agents doing things and. So I think this is this is universal, and I think that the universe is basically a uh, a, 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 a a giant set of competing and 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 cooperating perspectives, and it isn't just us. When we say us, it's it's everything. is It has some degree of inner perspective on the outside world. And if you're a rock, that inner perspective is infinitesimal. We can argue about whether it's zero, but uh, anything above that is going to, and, and life is very good at scaling up these 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 perspectives and, and, and detecting uh, agency and so on, um, is going to have uh, these kind of perspectives, and so so that's 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 my move. I think that I think that we really need to get much better at taking the perspective of other things that are not at all like us. And I think this has also, of course, social implications and whatever. I think we have a really hard time uh, looking at the world from the perspective of other things. And 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 I've been spending actually a lot of time in the last few weeks um, really thinking about this and thinking of tools uh, to help us um, take the perspective of of other systems. And, and I'll, I'll try to amplify the problem you describe, and I will recognize, uh, well, at least I'll try to convince you that I understand the problem, and then I'll try to articulate why, based on my own views, the problem isn't there. It is, uh, so the, the problem you see is we start as a single cell zygote, um, which is very simple. Well, relatively speaking, because the zygote, the, the biochemical machinery of that thing is, is unfathomable. Nobody has figured out, nobody has a model of that down to first principles. But, okay, relatively simple. Um, and then it becomes us. And we do have a point of view. Now, the same problem um, is playing out in physics. Uh, the measurement problem says that physical things only have existence in relation to an observing system. But what constitutes, constitutes an observing system? Well, anything constitutes an observing system. So anything may have a point of view. Um, I think both um, attempts to solve this problem are based on the following intuition. When it all starts, there is no point of view. And then suddenly there is a point of view. And this discontinuity is a problem. There is only two ways to solve it. Either everything has a point of view from the get-go, or you didn't start without a point of view. Uh, th th so th th that's one possibility. Um, it's the assumption that the zygote does not have a point of view, and a point of view then develops with growth that, that leads to the problem. It is the assumption that um, any physical system is analogous to any other physical system as far as the measurement problem is concerned that forces us to say anything is an observer because we don't have a well-behaved objective criterion to say no no this is a valid observing system and that is not or this is a thing and that is not it's a projection it's a, an, an arbitrary way of us carving out the world it is not a thing or to say um, the zygote doesn't have a point of view, but uh, a grown human has. Under my own view, uh, a zygote already has a point of view, because a point of view is what arises from dissociation. If there is a dissociative process, that dissociation creates a point of view. It, it, mm -hmm. it, it creates the observer, so to say, which is distinct from the world and therefore can observe because it is dissociated from the world. Otherwise, it's just the world. Um, 
then in philosophy, this question goes deeper. It's not only what has a point of view, which under analytic idealism is only living things, as I got, is living. So it, it developed a point of view, the moment of fecundation. Um, but um, in philosophy, it goes deeper. Like, what constitutes a thing? Is a painting hanging from your, your wall a thing? Is your table a thing? If so, are each of the four feet of the table four things? Isn't the table then just one thing, or is it five things? Is it the top of the table and the four feet? Now, so there is difficulty in even determining what a thing is, let alone what properties it has. Can it observe? Does it have a point of view? Does it have a will of its own? I mean, even before we get to that, asking whether you know a table has a point of view, whether a table has volition, we have to ask, is the table a thing? Or are we just projecting, projecting the epistemic structure of our language onto the ontology of the world? Not everything we have a distinct word for is a thing. This is a fist. We have a word for it. Boom, it has disappeared. Where is the fist? The laws of conservation of energy have just been violated because something has disappeared without releasing energy. How is that possible? You, you run into this kind of problems the moment we are not careful about paying attention about mistaking the structure of language for the ontological structure of the world, which we are very prone to doing because we are surrounded by language. We live in a wor world of language. So to me, um, what you are trying to do, uh, um, and, and you're probably a pioneer in this in biology, but you're not a pioneer of this in science in general because physics has been struggling with this for a while. Philosophy has been struggling with this for a while. You, the difficulty you are having is that you do not have a clear objective criterion to determine what is a thing as far as a certain definition of thingness uh, is concerned. And because you don't have that, then everything has to be a thing. Therefore, everything has to have a point of view in potential. Or not, if it's too simple like the zygote, then it doesn't have one, but we do. So what magic happens in the middle? Um, to me, fecundation, the, 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 the moment zero, T zero of life, is what determines a thing. Why? Why do I say that? Is it arbitrary? No, it's because unlike the question of whether the feet of a table are real things for which there is no ontological criteria. All criteria are epistemic. They are based on convenience. If, if that thing breaks, I need to have a word to refer to it so I can repair and put it another foot on my table. But there is one exception to this. Um, you know, if, if you follow, if, if you avoid applying epistemic criteria to carving out the world into things, there are no things. There is no car. If you say, well, a car is everything that is needed for the thing to move. Well, it needs the air for the combustion. Without the air, it doesn't move. It needs the road for the tires to grip. Without the road, it doesn't move. It needs gravity to pull it to the road. Without gravity, it doesn't move. So if you follow that criteria, that this, this kind of criteria, functionality criteria, which is how it's called in philosophy, then the whole universe is a thing. That's the, 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 um, there is even a name in philosophy for the blob theory. Uh, uh, whatever. Um, but there is one exception to this. There is one thing for which we have objective criteria to say, these are things. And that's life. Because if you stick a needle on the arm of my chair, I don't feel it. But if you stick it on my arm, I do feel it. So there is a clear boundary between what I do register and what I don't register. That boundary uh, determines me as a real thing not as just a sort of an arbitrary collection of pixels on the screen of, per of perception that we give a name to. It's like saying, you know, take the Mona Lisa and group all the pixels or all the infinitesimal dots of, uh, of, of pigment that are around yellow given a certain tolerance and you call that a thing. No, th that's what we do, the, this kind of arbitrary grouping of the pixels of reality. But when it comes to life, it's not. And we know that firsthand. We know where the limits of our thingness are. You know, shoot the wall, nothing happens. Shoot the head, well, something very dramatic uh, um, happens in my inner life. So to me, that zygote already has a point of view because that's what life is. Life is when life is formed. What we call the 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 rise of life 
is the rise of a point of view because it's the image of a dissociative process. And then adult human is that zygote still. It's not another system. That zygote didn't um, get together with trillions of other cells that pile up on top of each other to form us. That's not the history of us. That zygote underwent mitosis, cell division. Um, and here we are already passing a, a sort of metaphysical judgment by, by talking about cell division. What's happening, if you look at it um, neutrally, that zygote is inner complexifying. It's creating inner structure. And because it only knows how to be a cell, that's how it started, then that inner structure is a sort of an iterative, self-similar, fractal complexification. It creates structure by adding more of the only thing it knows how to be. Um, so that's why it started with a point of view and has a point of view. Now it's the same thing. I am the zygote that was in the womb of my mother. It's just that that zygote complexified, created in a structure fractally by repeating the template, the only template it knew uh, how to be. Um, this wouldn't be correct if the way human beings came to being were by, you know, a trillion cells crawling and piling on top of each other to form us. It doesn't happen like this. So, uh, sorry, I, I was passionate uh, about this, uh, Michael. Normally, I... I my admiration for you forces me to be <laughs> more polite. I hope you didn't take it um, as an attack. It's not, but I, no. I, this is something I feel passionate about. Of course, no, no, this is great. And Amir, you can you can tell us when it's time to move on to a different topic because we could. I think I think we could talk about this for a really long time. But I mean, I would just say I, I would say a couple of things. Uh, I, I I agree with you that the zygote already has a perspective. I agree with that. Um, I I, uh, I I also think that uh, this 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 business of whether something is a thing or not, I, I don't like the binary framing of it. I, I don't think we need a binary classification. I think uh, what's more interesting than that are uh, the ability of various perspectives to recognize persistent patterns. Somebody with a very long, um, you know, a, a, a lifetime, you know, well, let's say, let's say a cognitive a life, lifespan of millions of years would look at each of us as a temporary metabolic blip in the, it's a pattern. It's like a wave that showed up and it's gone. You know, there's no permanence in, in anything that, uh, that, you know, in our bodies. And, and the other thing I would say is that, you know, the time zero of uh, the fertilization event, I, I really don't take it as seriously as, as you do, because I, I visualize what's happening there. So and so what's happening there is that you have, a, you have an unfertilized oocyte. We can see how it got there. So the steps So what you have is a bunch of nurse cells that basically create a, a new cell and they sort of shove it full of useful materials that it's going to have later on. And, and there it is. And now you've, so, so it starts out as a bunch of chemical processes. And then at some point uh, the sperm shows up. I mean, it's cool and all, but but you can you can you can uh, duplicate that with a with a poke of a needle. Actually, in many organisms, you can do it without this without the sperm. You can just sort of poke them with a needle, and 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 they undergo parthenogenesis, and they start to you know various things. Some calcium comes in, and and the membrane becomes impermeable to new sperm, and then some some more chemical reactions happen. I I'm I'm just not sure there's anything fundamentally. Uh, profound that happens at fertilization per se. And I think we could, I can imagine in not too far future, all of those early processes being done exactly as you said before, by an aggregation kind of phenomenon, right? We could, we could replace those, um, those nurse cells with little, little microfluidic pumps that, right, that create the thing and then and kick started with a needle and so on. I, I, I think the whole thing is much more continuous and, and it's about a trans, what I see when I look at biology and when I look at the world, what I see is a, a, a constant transformation, meaning growing and shrinking and a reshuffling of perspectives. I see cognitive light cones that can be very large. They can be very small. They're all looking at each other. They're all making estimates about, about where the other beings are and what the, you know, sort of um, uh, a, a, a cognitive capacity of these, of these beings are. And, uh, you know, and, and I just, I'm, I'm just not seeing any binary categories for, for us or for thingness or for anything else. I think there are just perspectives. I'll, I'll briefly comment on this. I mean, I think we are sort of beginning to converge or at least identifying where we, 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 we don't agree, but very briefly, just to prevent a misunderstanding. Um, I don't think fecundation is the rise of a point of view from no points of view. 
fecundation is two points of view creating a third. So it's from points of view to a different point of view. So it's not a fundamental transition. You're not creating something out that, that that's fundamentally new. It already started with two previous points of view. But those two previous points of views mixed in a certain way and out comes a different point of view. Um, what I think is what I, I think is trickier, and maybe you agree with me, um, is that is abiogenesis, is the rise of life from non-life, is when you truly create a point of view from things that were not a point of view. That is a little trickier, otherwise we would have done it already. You would have done it already. Uh, uh, um, Craig Venter would have done it already, but all he managed to do was to synthesize DNA and implant it on a sort of empty shell that, that was alive. It started from life. So there seems to be something, you know, if you ask me, do I think we will artificially be able to induce abiogenesis? I think we will. I, I don't see any fundamental reason for us not to be able to do that because obviously it has happened at least once in the universe. So if it has happened, it can happen. And if it can happen, you know, maybe it would take the monkeys another 500 years, but I, I don't see any fundamental reason why the monkeys won't be able to do that. But it is on a different level and level of complexity than than fecundation i think otherwise we would have done it already what do we say amir should we uh keep more of that or, or or go on to something else well um i mean someone put in the comments uh i think it's such an important topic it's my favorite one i don't want to bias the whole group but several people put little emoticons on that um so i this is kind of fundamental to who we are and what we are <laughs> conscious do. So I, I, don't, I don't think there's a more important topic that really people put in the chat and everyone who thinks, no, we really need to discuss this, put lots of emoticons on it, and then we'll see, okay, there's something people feel we urgently need to discuss. The only thing I'm uh, nervous is I, um, uh, in terms of the group is I'm following it, but mainly thanks to having, you know, Watch a lot of your uh, stuff, Michael, and also been immersed in this for, for a little bit. So I just wonder um, if it's worth like a, sh a short recap, if that's possible, and then do the the kind of ChatGPT version of like, okay, s summarize this debate in in a in a in a paragraph in simple terms. I don't know if that's possible for you, but. Yeah, yeah, that's 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 going to be tough. Uh, I I think because we're 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 talking about a number of really really deep issues here. I mean, one one thing I think that we're discussing is whether there are binary categories for some of the interesting things that we talk about. For example, living or not living. Now, this may be crazy for biologists to say, but I don't actually believe that's a distinction. So so I think it's a spectrum. I don't believe that that. Uh, you know, uh, you can say something is life or not life. I think what you can say is, uh, do, 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 to, to what degree does uh, is something good at scaling the cognitive light cone of its parts? I think we call things alive where uh, the system itself it has a larger and a more interesting um, cognitive light cone than all of its parts have, you know, so rocks don't do that, right? So, so, so little, little um, particles have a very tiny, I don't think it's zero, but, but, but I think it's extremely tiny uh, cognitive light cone and the rock has exactly the same, but living things are actually very good at, at scaling these perspectives and, and, and climbing up that, that, um, that cognitive hierarchy. But to me, it's a continuum. Um, and I think that, you know, I, I, I think that uh, the creation of life from scratch as, you know, the abiogenesis that, that Bernardo was talking about, I, I, I think we are, as you say, I think we're going to get there. I don't think, I don't think there are, I, th I think it's a technological issue that's stopping us now. It's not a knowledge issue. It's not a um, kind of a, you know, a fundamental thing, but Anyway, I think I think we're talking about that whether whether there are, there are these binary categories, and I think we're also talking about whether there are objective facts about the about the, you, know, you know what what a thing is or whether something is an agent or is not, and and so wh whether that's the case or whether everything is a matter of a perspective from some kind of system, you know, is it is it super helpful to take the perspective of a table? I think not. I think you don't end up with much. But I do think that there are uh, systems that we can build that might be biological, that might be technological, that might be hybrid. So we make hybrids, which have a little bit of biology, but otherwise, they're basically a, 
uh, an engineered uh, system and to really understand, to relate to that system, to understand what it's doing, what it's capable of, in some cases to have ethical relationships with it, I think you do need to take its perspective, not as a um, a, a, a technique or or a uh, or a you know a, a, a bit of fakery that you in um, that you indulge in to to help the science go, but actually fundamentally, you know, I I really do believe that uh, all kinds of things have perspectives that we currently do not recognize. I, I don't think we're very good at recognizing the perspective of unconventional systems that are not like us. And, uh, and, and I think they're real in the sense that anything is real. And I mean, I share, you know, basic, of, you know, kind of these, these idealist, um, you know, kind of basic uh, ideas with, with, with Bernardo, but I think it, there are way more perspectives in the universe than we think, you know? Do you associate life with uh, Varelan autopoiesis? I think I think it's I, so. So what I think is autopoiesis is, is very important for is the creation of a mind, not life. I think I think cognitive. I'm I'm much more interested in the cognitive um, kind of uh, distinctions than than life or not life. I don't think I th I think we can absolutely make things that would um, engage in some degree of autopoiesis that w that some people wouldn't call alive, I guess. I don't even know. I don't have a good definition for life. You could, you know, you could bring on Sarah Walker or somebody who really thinks about life per se. Um, and, and she would have a different opinion, I think. I don't spend much time thinking about life at all. I, but I, but I, but I do think that autopoiesis is is a critical component of making a mind with a significant inner perspective. If you're not autopoetic, you're going to have an extremely small uh, in, inner perspective. When you say that non-living things may have perspectives, do you mean that there is something it is like to be them that they are conscious uh, in their own? right in their own given the boundaries of their own system i so so this is uh the, you know the what's it like to be is an interesting question because look if you say let's go back to the kind of original you know what's it like to be a bat right so what are we really asking there if you ask that question what's it like to be some kind of a system if you what i think you're really talking about is a relationship between two things in other words if i really knew what it was like to be a bat there would just be one more bat Okay, I wouldn't be finding out what it's like to be a bat. If I really, really knew everything about what it was to be a bat, I would just be a bat, and, and that's it. There'd be one more bat, and, and I wouldn't learn a darn thing. There'd be a, there would be a bat. So, so what we're really talking about is some kind of a, I, I view it as some kind of a control knob um, where what you're really saying is, I'm going to retain some features of myself, but I'm going to twist this knob a little bit so that some other things are going to change. I'll become more bat-like. And then I'm going to know what it's like to some extent to be like this other creature. I don't, you know, if you go all the way, then you, you then you're just whatever it is. So, so I think it's a, I think that question is actually much harder than, than um, a lot of people make it out to be, but, but yes, I, I do think that some things that is currently people would not classify as living and I don't know, I mean, people like if you look at a textbook that, that, that kids use, they use all kinds of uh, criteria, you know, it has to be uh, subject to the laws of evolution, and it has to have metabolism and, you know, some other stuff, right? So there may be some, some criteria like that. Uh, yeah, I think that I think that there can be and, and probably are uh, both here and outer, you know, sort of wider in the universe, um, things that would fail those criteria, and that do have a useful inner perspective from which to see the universe. Do you think viruses have a conscious perspective? Um, I, I so 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 I re, I reject the 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 do they or don't they kind of thing, right? Because okay. I, I I I will not try to put it in a in a category. I will simply ask the question: If you try to view the world from the perspective of a virus, what do you see? And I think you see very little. I don't think you see zero, but I think you see very little. And so and so that's what we're talking about. I, I think all of this is about. Uh, what is the what is the cognitive light cone? And and this is by the way an experimental. I mean, people people said this about uh, about cells and tissues. They say oh, it's zero. And I'm saying no, you need to do experiments. And if you do experiments, you might find that there actually is a very useful inner perspective that you can try to uh, at least um, uh, uh, get your head around. You you're, you're never going to be it. You're never going to be that system. But you can at least try. So. Um, you know, do, do, yes. Do, do I think they have some degree of inner perspective? Yes. Do, is it is it is it uh, significant? I think it's extremely small. If, if you look at integrated information theory, they are flexible about what where the boundaries are. 
I mean, flexible. The theory implies where the boundaries are, but that doesn't necessarily line up with life, at least not in principle, not a priori. Maybe yeah. in practice, it may line up with life. And as far as we know, it does, but not, not a priori. Um, but the theory does say, even if we don't know where the boundaries are, because we don't have the instrumentation to make the measurements that are needed for us to derive uh, that conclusion, there are boundaries because of the exclusion principle in IIT. So um, whatever, yeah. whatever states become part of a complex, their perspective becomes subsumed in the perspective of the entire complex. In other words, the, com the states that form a complex do not have a perspective of their own. That's the integrated information part uh, of the yeah. theory. Do, yeah. do, you, do you disagree with that? Do you think it's, there aren't such criteria for determining what is subsumed and what is not? I, what, what I don't, well, a couple of things, uh, again, and I mean, you know, I, I, I don't believe that there are objective criteria for any of this. I think all of these criteria are from the perspective of some observer, which in the case of significant systems like living systems is the system itself. Okay. What, what I don't like, I mean, IIT, what, what, what I, the one thing I don't like about it is that exclusion axiom. Right. I mean, it's basically something that's just sort of added on to with my understanding of it anyway, is that it's just added on. I, I, I don't like it because um, I, I do think that uh, even even in the in the human organism, there are multiple uh, there are multiple selves, multiple perspectives of different degrees of sophistication. I mean, it's awesome that we have these left hemispheres that can can uh, uh, talk to each other and verbally and, and make claims about how conscious they are and how they don't think the liver is conscious. And, you know, I mean, after all, I don't feel the liver being conscious, right? But, and, and that's great. But uh, that's because I, I think that's because, and I, and I you know, I, I don't say much about consciousness usually, but, but, but just this kind of roll with it here. Um, I, I think that's because we have a very hard time taking the perspective of other beings in other problem spaces. So, so I do think that, for example, the, the, the liver, let's just, let's just take that. I think the liver is an, an intelligent agent that navigates physiological state space. It's a, uh, it's a space that we have a very hard time visualizing. Our sense organs did not train us to, to, to navigate that, to, to see that space. We're, we're bad at recognizing things that work at other time scales and other uh, spaces. And I think that if we did, if we were better at uh, directly, just imagine like, like here's, here's how you might um, uh, engineer a being that could do this. Imagine a human that was born with an innate sense of their blood chemistry. Right, the way that you feel and see and whatever, you also had some receptors for, I don't know, 20 different parameters of your blood chemistry and, and, and you could feel it directly. I think if we had that, if we, if, we had, uh, if we were that kind of creature, I think we had no problem recognizing that um, our, our liver is, uh, is an agent with some degree of intelligence, navigating that space, dealing with all kinds of stuff that, that happens, not just because it's complex. It's not an issue of complexity. It's an issue of problem solving. It's an issue of having preferences. Your liver absolutely has preferences about uh, which, which kinds of blood chemistry it likes better than others and, and how it feels about certain things you drink and, and the stuff like that. And I think that if, uh, if we were better at recognizing these things, we would a be able to 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 uh, to notice it. B, we would uh, be able to communicate with it better. I mean, this is our research program now is literally trying to communicate with these things, not micromanage them, not force them, but to improve the biomedicine of drug use and regeneration and so on. When I say drug, I mean ph pharmacology. Um, uh, uh, to to use these things uh, as a way of. Uh, getting buy-in from the tissues. I mean, literally getting the tissues to, to not fight back and not to cause all these um, uh, issues with, uh, with, with, you know, with all these different reasons that drugs fail and so on, but to actually communicate with that, with that primitive intelligence. Uh, and uh, yeah, I think, I think I, you know, and, and of course we don't feel it to be conscious because we don't feel each other to be conscious either. Right. Uh, you know, that, that's anyway, that's 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 my take on it. But the, the, the IIT is consistent with the, with what you said. Um, IIT does not say that there is only one complex in a living creature. Um, uh, what it says is that uh, whatever is part of a, of a complex, then the only point of view is that of the complex. The subparts do not have their own point of view. Their, their, their own point of view becomes subsumed in the global point of view of the complex. Mm -hmm. But there are many complexes uh, in a living being. Um, yeah. And one of them could entail the liver. Uh, th th this is completely consistent with IIT and even with analytic idealism because the liver is part of a living body. So uh, to me, it's, it, it's perfectly okay 
uh, to talk about you know the multiple complexes that form us yeah. and there is even a lot of empirical evidence for this you know that there has been this back and forth about what happens to consciousness when you sever the corpus callosum mm -hmm. you know, initially they said well consciousness splits in two and then they talked to the patient and the patient said nothing changed and then and then they decided okay it, uh, it didn't split in two but now with modern experiments we are seeing that in fact they have split mm -hmm. in two yeah. uh, it's just that each consciousness of the two does not notice a difference because it's dissociated from the other from the other and doesn't know about the presence of the other but people right. behave as two like you can ask them you can ask people uh, two different questions and um, depending on whether the answer comes verbally or from writing the answer is different because okay. it's it's the left hemisphere uh, controlling language and if you're writing with your left hand then it's the right hemisphere controlling that and the answers are different which is amazing amazing if you confront people with this they will they will confabulate a yeah. completely implausible story for why they did that and they will insist that uh, oh, nothing changed i am still me so uh, all of this is consistent I, 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 iit does not contradict uh, what you said um i would even if 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 I may make a suggestion, uh, uh, Michael, uh, I think a collaboration between you and Julia could lead to some very interesting things. Yeah, I, I agree. Yeah, and Ju Julia and I have talked about these kind of things. We are we are using some of those um, techniques to look for uh, not not really phi, but various surrogate metrics of 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 phi in in the various things. Like for example, in this in the scenario where we do have cells that come together to become a xenobot or to, uh, you know, we have other kinds of systems where cells come together, like, like to literally watch, right? Can we, can we look at by tracking calcium signaling and other things? Can we actually watch the integration happening? Yeah, I, I agree with you. I think, I think that's, that's, uh, that's super interesting. Um, there's, there's another, you know, there's another thing uh, here that I think might end up being very relevant to this, which is, which is something else that uh, I've been thinking about a lot recently having to do with having to do with memory. And the way that, and this is this is related to these to these pers to, to this issue of perspectives, and one way. So so let's just go back to the to the basic example that that I um, bring up a lot, which is you got you got a caterpillar. You train the caterpillar to eat some eat some leaves or on on a particular color disc, and it remembers, and so on. And then the, and then that caterpillar becomes becomes a butterfly. So in the process of becoming a butterfly, basically most of its brain is dissolved, most of the connections are broken. It rebuilds a new brain. Now you got this butterfly, and the butterfly still recalls the original information. So one thing that 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 you might think about is, wow, uh, where is the information stored during this process? And that's an interesting topic question. But there's actually a much more interesting issue here, which is that keeping information still, meaning recording it and making sure it doesn't change is, is, is a minor part of this. The more major part of this is the fact that the butterfly and the caterpillar are completely different architectures. So first of all, uh, the butterfly does not eat what the caterpillar eats, right? So, so the butterfly doesn't care about the leaves at all. And what you actually have to do, the, the, the caterpillar lives in a two-dimensional world. It crawls around. The butterfly uh, lives in this, in this three-dimensional world. And so what you really have here is the ability for uh, information to get remapped in a way that in your new life as a, as a, literally, I mean, this is going to sound crazy, but, but literally, this is all literally true. In your new life as a higher dimensional being, what you're going to remember is not the details of the things you learned before, but the salient um, uh, meaning, the, 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 the part of that, the lessons that you learned that are actually relevant to your new life. And they are going to get remapped onto a completely different set of muscles and, and different behavioral repertoires uh, in a butterfly than, than existed in the, in the, in the caterpillar. So, so this issue of remapping information and the importance of, from the perspective of, right. So, so you've got, I mean, of course it's, it's going to have some kind of, a uh, uh, medium, that, so some kind of engram that holds the information. What you have to ask is then from the perspective of whom, what does that information mean? So from the perspective of the caterpillar, it might mean, um, you know, crawl in a certain way and get yourself some, some leaves. From a perspective of a butterfly, it means, oh no, flap your wings a different way and you're gonna get some nectar. Uh, but they're, they're reinterpreting this information from different um, perspectives. And I think, I think once, you start, once you start thinking about this importance of, remapping information to new contexts, some, some very interesting things happen. For example, uh, if we think about the 
evolutionary lineage as a, as an, as a, as a whole organism, right? So I don't know, if, you know, some, some 50 million years of alligators or something. So like, like the whole, the whole lineage, what you know, for a fact, if, if, if you're, if, if you're that lineage, what you know, for a fact is that everything is going to change. Your, your body is going to change because there will be mutations. Your cells are going to change because there will be different um, chemical, uh, you know, uh, properties in your environment. If you, try to take the, the information you learned in your past too seriously, if you sort of overtrain on those priors, you know it's going to be poorly you, um, uh, applicable in the, in the future. What I think evolution does, I think it fundamentally makes, be, because, because everything is change and everything is guaranteed to, to be different, what I think it fundamentally does is mechanisms that are perspectives, that are trying to uh, extract salience from my current situation uh, from whatever you you were inherited, wh wh whatever you inherited from from the previous times. This is why bi biology is so incredibly interoperable that we can, you know, we can take the cells out and put them. You know, we can. Well, I didn't even get to talk about anthrobots yet, which is this whole new thing that uh, that we published recently. Um, you can you can take the cells out, combine them with uh, with with some kind of weird nanomaterial that they've never seen before, and always something uh, something useful and something coherent happens. And it's because I think fundamentally uh, life and evolution have bought into the assumption that uh, things are not going to be the same, that you're going to have to re uh, you're going to have to reinterpret and remap what you have from a different perspective. And you can think about this uh, as uh, in, you know, we, I mean, we're not butterfly caterpillars, but we kind of have this too. You know, when, 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 when we were children, we had certain memories and certain things were very important and other things were less important. And then, you know, puberty kicks in and, and all kinds of stuff happens. Your brain is remodeled by, uh, by the hormones and whatever. And you have to now, you know, you still have those memories. They make some sort of sense to you. And in fact, each memory recall we know now is not a non-destructive read, right? Every, 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 instance of recall actually modifies the, the memory a little bit. And so this, so, so I think this is, this is, uh, this is just really important. The ability of, I, I think that's another thing that's special, right? So autopoiesis is one, but the other thing that's special about um, what, uh, what things that we call living is that they're just very good at um, compressing down uh, the complex uh, uh, states of a of a of, of 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 an organism at time t, compressing it down to a narrow, you know, kind of almost like the you know the middle the, the middle node of an autoencoder or something, right? You you sh you shrunk it down, and then you're going to reinflate it, but you might reinflate it onto a completely different context. You're not going to be the same as you were before, right? And none none of us are are, are are the same, and and you can see that in 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 um, in evolution where you shrink it down every generation, shrinks it down to an egg, reinflates down to an egg, reinflates. Uh, and, and, and we can, communication is that way too, right? So I have a complicated brain state here. If I give you a matrix of all my neuronal, um, states at this time, there's nothing you can do with it because your brain is, is somewhat of a different structure. Even if we're the same species, you can't map it exactly, but language gives us a nice narrow interface, right? Where I can take all of that. I can squeeze it down to a message. I give you the message. You're going to reinflate it in your own cognitive system. Uh, however, however you can, you know, it may, it may end up the same as, as, as uh, how I sent or may, it may not, but you will preserve the salience, right? You're going to squeeze the salience out of it. And so that's what I think is really important about, um, about memory as message passing between, uh, temporal slices of beings and that having a perspective from which you interpret your engrams, your environment, everything else. Um, yeah, I think, I think that's really key. I can't remember what we agreed, Michael, you, you staying uh two and a half hours or two hours or how much time do we have you for uh i got another half hour no problem ha half hour so i think this uh crowd especially in me um would be interested in your thoughts on you've hinted at a platonic realm it's it's, it's speculative um has some utility in explaining some things in evolution if i've understood you correctly Do you comfortable with bringing the conversation in that direction for a bit uh, sure. Yeah. And this is, uh, I, you know, just, just, just to be clear, this is, this is uh, right at the, at the edge of, uh, of uh, things that uh, I feel certain about. So I'm just going to kind of say some stuff that, that I've been thinking, and I have no idea if this is going to uh, in the end be, uh, be, uh, you know, useful or, or, or mature properly or what. So just, just some thoughts. Um, 
the 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 way I got into it was uh, through through the creation of uh, the various uh, synthetic um, kinds of uh, life forms that we make. So we make xenobots. The more recent thing I'll just tell you about is anthrobots. So when we made so so xenobots are um, self assembling um, little proto organisms that uh, that come together when we scrape some some uh, skin cells off of early frog embryos. They can come together and have all kinds of interesting behaviors and and, and so on. And uh, there's there's a bunch of new stuff that isn't that isn't published yet about new new genes that that these guys express that frog embryos don't express and so on. Um, but one of the things that you might think when you see that and you say, well, uh, amphibians, we know amphibians are plastic. We know that embryos are very plastic. Maybe this is a frog embryonic thing. You know, maybe this is just specific to frog embryos. And so what what um, what we wanted to do was to get as far away from that as possible. And so what's far away from fro from embryonic frogs? Well, that would be adult humans. And so this is this is a project by um, a PhD students. She just uh, defended uh, Gizem Gumushkaya in my group. Uh, and what we did was we took uh, tracheal epithelial cells from adult human patients. So no embryonic, uh, you know, no human embryos, but adult patients, they donate these um, tracheal epithelial cells. Um, and uh, what, what we found was a protocol in which these cells are given a second life. They basically, uh, they basically grow into, again, a kind of self motile little organism if i had uh, well you can see this on uh, there's a there's a blog post about it. you can see the little video this thing running around and um and so they have a again they have a they have a different um different morphology than the normal humans or human embryos they have different gene expression uh they have uh the ability they have some interesting abilities one thing that we found is that when they uh, when they encounter a scratch in um, a bunch of uh, human peripheral neurons, they will actually heal that scratch. This is not in patients yet. This is in a petri dish. But if you make a, a damage to a to a lawn of neurons, the the anthrobots will can can sit down there and over about four days they sort of knit the two sides together and repair the damage. I mean, who would have thought that your tracheal cells, which normally sit there quietly for decades in your in your lung epithelium, have the ability to run around and heal neural wounds when given the opportunity? Right. So 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 you get these emergent novel um, uh, 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 novel capabilities, uh, novel uh, uh, f f structures and, and 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 we're just scratching the surface still. We, we, we don't know I think even even a tiny bit of what they can do. But if you when, once you start thinking about where do these competencies come from, typically speaking, if you look at any kind of an animal uh, or plant the, you say, okay, so why does it have certain um, uh, certain uh, shapes and certain behaviors. The typical answer is, well, evolution, of course, eons of selection. So it was selected, you know, the frog is uh, the frog, the frog genome knows how to make frogs because that is what it was selected for is success in a, in a, in a froggy environment. But, but here you get to, and, and certainly our data are not the only ones. There are other, other data like this. You get to a scenario where you've got these things. Well, there was no history of anthrobots. There, there was never selective pressure for your tracheal epithelial cells to be able to run around on their own and heal neural wounds. There was, there was, there were no no xenobots. You know, xenobots are able to construct other xenobots by running around and collecting together loose skin cells that we give them. You know, as we call it, kinematic self replication. Um, there's never been any xenobots. There's never been selection to no no other animal on Earth, uh, as, as far as anybody knows, reproduces like this. W where do these capacities come from? So you can start to think that maybe what's happening, and obviously I'm not the first person to think this. So a lot of a lot of um, classic philosophy thought about the, the, this this idea that there is uh, there's some sort of latent space or or a Platonic space in which certain kinds of um, I, I don't even know what to call them. I'm not going to call them objects, but 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 certain kind of um, uh, things hang out there, and these these things become instantiated. They become uh, implemented in the real world when physical machines show up that are uh, good uh, embodiments for them. So, for example, when when evolution discovers uh, different uh, uh, ion channels that are voltage sensitive, that immediately gives you a, a voltage gated current conductance, which is basically a transistor. So now you now you can you can make use of all the rules of logic gates and the truth tables and, and all these kinds of things uh, that and you get that for free. You don't need to evolve all this all the states of a truth table for 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 ands and ors. You you've you've immediately got got this for free by by inventing this little thing. And there's lots of uh, things like that that you can find that that will make use of the laws of 
of of adhesion and and uh, you know other other laws of mathematics and computation and 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 mechanics biomechanics and and other things so if you if you think about evolution as basically searching the space of pointers into this platonic space then it becomes reasonable to um, have a research program of uh, looking around to see what the structure of that space is. And so, so people do that, like, for example, you can download this thing called the map of mathematics, right? And it's, and it's just like a visualization of the different types of, uh, different types of, um, types of mathematics and how they sort of connect together and, and so on. So you could imagine that, that these things that we make, so these xenobots, anthrobots, all the, all the kind of synthetic constructs, what they really are, are little periscopes. They're little, little ways to, to kind of stick a probe up into this space and, and look around and see what do we normally pull down in a normal embryo. And a normal embryo uses tons of these kind of, um, you know, what physicists would call free, free lunches, like lots of lots of these, these um, amazing uh, effects that they make use of that they don't have to evolve from scratch. But around them, there are sets of, uh, sets of halos of other things that they could use if the situation was a little bit different. And, and by, by doing these perturbational experiments, by, by pushing the, the embryo into, into, uh, into scenarios uh, that are different from what it normally does, you get to explore the, the space. You get to explore the, all the stuff that's around it in latent space. And you find, oh, actually they can do this and this and this. And, and we can even, uh, you know, we can start to think about what else is out there as a, uh, as a tool for engineering and for discovery. So, so that's, you know, that's the kind of, and, and, and so that's step, step one, I guess, is just to, is just to realize that, that a lot of what evolution does is uh, search through the space of, uh, of, of pointers into this, uh, into this reservoir of these, these amazing ca uh, um, capabilities. And then, um, and then the other thing, the other thing you can, you can ask, and this is, you know, it gets progressively weirder and, and I, you know, I don't, this is just, this, this pro project is just beginning, but you can actually also ask the question of what are the, the, the contents of that space? What is it doing on its own when it's not being instantiated here in the physical world? In other words, the traditional, at least my, my understanding of the, of the traditional conception is that these things are um, time, these, these forms are timeless. They just sort of sit there and they don't change and they're permanent and they are how they are. Um, I, I'm not sure of that. We, we, I now have this, this kind of multi-layer model where uh, we can start to imagine some um, I don't want to call it chemistry, but 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 some some rules for ways that these things can actually interact with each other, and uh, some dynamics that can go on. And I have some ideas based on um, the work of Patrick Grimm and uh, turning um, uh, logic sentences into uh, into visualizable dynamical systems. How you can think about what the interaction laws and what the chemistry might be of these kinds of concepts, aside from from the time when they're actually pulled down into a physical machine. Uh, in in the in the physical world, so that's the I don't know if this makes any sense, but but you know that's the that's the stuff that I've been thinking about. I find this fascinating. Um, Michael Roger Penrose is well known for talking about this platonic realm as well. So for three decades now, I think he is. Uh, people who want to put him down, they say Roger is not even a dualist; he's a trialist because he's saying there is the physical stuff, there is the mental stuff, and then there is the platonic stuff. Um, my my own perspective, and I, I I wanted to sort of run that by you and mm. get your thoughts on it, is that um, we don't need a separate thing. If, if if we say okay, all of existence is a play in a in a field of mentation, a field of subjectivity, um, then that field exists, and to be to exist is to have properties. In other words, that field is what it is, and not something else that it conceivably could have been. It is not that, it is what it is, and therefore it does what it does. It has properties, it has uh, intrinsic, inherent dispositions, uh, preferred ways of, of behaving, preferred templates of behavior, so to say, and um, to, to, to abuse the language from depth uh, psychology, you could call these templates archetypes, which is the name Jung came up with. In other words, if this is all one field of mentation, then it has, to use a physical metaphor, it has um, its preferred frequencies of oscillation. It has harmonics. It has resonant uh, frequencies because it is what it is. And to, to be is to have properties and it has the properties it has and not others. 
could these sort of intrinsic inherent resonant frequencies, this, in, this archetypal templates, account for what you're talking about without our having to postulate a separate platonic realm? Yeah, yes, yeah, super. Uh, so, so on the one hand, I mean, I, I I agree with you in that I don't think it's fundamentally like like really in the end of all things, I don't think it's a separate realm. So I agree with you that this is all you know these are all components of one fundamental um, field. But uh, I, I think for the time being, I think that's a that's a that's a u useful um, it's a useful frame to think of this because it because it 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 leads to specific questions about how do we explore it, how do we map it, the things like that, right? But 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 the the um, the frequencies and the vibrations, I'm, I'm really glad you brought that up because that that's that's an interesting example of uh, actually how what what we're doing and how we're studying it. Um, think of uh, what, what one thing that you might think that hangs out in this in this uh, Platonic um, realm. One thing that might hang out there are logical statements. Right, just just you know pieces of uh, pieces of uh, basic basic logic, right? So so let's take uh, let's take the uh, the liar paradox. That it's a self referential sentence that says uh, that says this self this sentence is false. So one interesting thing about that is um, there's this philosopher Patrick Grimm. Uh, if anybody hasn't uh, doesn't know, he's he's really good, uh, and he had this work in the '90s, which is very interesting, where he points out the following: if you um, if you if you look at that sentence, uh, it's a paradox only if you insist on a static, unchanging truth value. Yeah. So if you want a truth value, you're not going to you you can't, and it's a paradox. And okay, what do we do? But if you're willing to say that what it actually is is a dynamical system where you actually look at it and you say, okay, this statement is false. Okay, so it's false, and you say, oh wait a minute, but that must mean it's true. So it's true. So so as you as a mind as a perspective looks on this thing. What you actually see is a is an oscillation. You see a true false, true false, true false. So now, so now something interesting happens. And 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 Grimm showed how um, you can take either one dimensional or two dimensional. So you can do things like he'll say, you know, sentence A, um, I am as true as sentence B is false. And then sentence B says, I am twice as true as sentence A, right? And you plot those true, and you get this like crazy thing and then it's chaotic and sometimes they settle down sometimes they don't settle down you can imagine dynamical systems that you know you can make all kinds of so so now what you've got is is something interesting so so there's a layer of this of this space con consisting of logical statements some of them are like rocks they have a constant truth value you know pi is is more than three bang that that just sits there it doesn't do anything it's completely static pretty boring and so so that kind of hangs out but then you've got this other thing that's like a it's like a it's like a simple oscillator, right? It's like a simple, you know, the the simple the the liar, the, the basic liar paradox is just it's just sitting there and it's oscillating, true, false, true, false, true, false. That's what it's doing. So this is this is what led me to this idea that that it may not actually be these like um, uh, forms that are locked in stone and don't do anything. Some of them look like they have a dynamics to it. Then you can imagine. Uh, multiple sentences that are interacting with each other and they have a really complex and you can plot them in different ways. You can either plot them as a function of time, in which case they, they vibrate and they have different frequencies, as you just said, and they do all these things. Or you can plot them in a slightly higher dimensional space and then you just get this shape, right? You get the shape that you can see and say, okay, this set of logical claims makes this, this crazy complicated looking shape and Grimm actually like plots some of these out. It's pretty cool. So... Um, <laughs> And, and so, 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 just one last thing. And so, we're building. I have I, um, one of the uh, f folks in my lab, and I are making an actual visualizer for these things, so that you start with some logical statements, and then you actually see what what they look like. Uh, you can now comes the part where you can actually instantiate a chemistry to it, because what you can say is, okay, here's a set of statements that refer to a, a few different things. Let's say, you know, A, B, C. Here's a set of statements that refer to C, D, and E. Well, they have something in common. That would be the C, and that means that you can imagine, like atoms with a with a free, you know, with a free uh, a hole in their orbital, they can they can actually come come together because you can they can combine. If it was A, B, C, and D, E, F, then you know, no, noble gases, right? They don't combine at all. They don't interact with each other. They sort of slide right by. But 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 sen but sets of sentences that that do refer to things in common. Now you can look at intersect at, at their interactions, and you can say, well, when they do come together, what happens? So this thing has a shape. This thing has a shape. When they come together, what's the shape? So it turns out that. And this is just like a tiny corner of that space. We're just looking at something super like simple and 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 uh, and basic, which is just like these logical sentences. Of course, if if that space exists at all, there's going to be like a huge amount of things in there that we don't know how to deal with. But just just that alone, uh, 
you, we can we can start to and, and then you can ask some some things like this for for example what's the what's the frequency of the oscillator there isn't a time component here the, the well there isn't an external time component here what there is is the frame rate of whatever cognitive system is picking up that liar paradox. So the liar paradox is hanging out there. When you have a system that can follow it through at a rate of one per second, for example, well, then that's the frequency at that time. Yeah. If you, right, if you're, if you're much faster than that, well, then you get a faster fee, right? So it's not intrinsic. It's again, from the perspective of whichever mind has now, you know, is now in resonance with this thing. So all that is, and so this is all super early. Like, I don't know if, if any of this is going to go anywhere. So take it all with a grain of salt. But I do very much like that you immediately went to the um, kind of vibration stuff, because I think that's a good way to start thinking about it. And there's also, um, if any of you have seen, and I don't, I don't remember the link at the top of my head, but uh, Richard Watson, who's an evolutionary biologist and computer scientist that I do a lot of uh, collaborations with, he has an amazing set of videos on YouTube. It's about six hours total called Songs of Mind and Life. And it digs very deep into this, into this, not, not the platonic space stuff, but, but, the, but this notion of um, the intersection between um, cognition and, uh, and, and vibration and, uh, and, and things like that. And so if, if anybody's interested in that, definitely check it out. It's, it's just amazing. It is fascinating that you're going in this direction. I didn't know that. I'm very happy to learn it. Uh, just a brief comment. Uh, I'm not just to add to, to your plate. <laughs> things that you can think about uh, the liar paradox you can make it more complex because you can split it you can say the fall the next sentence is false mm. while the next sentence is the previous sentence is true mm. and then you sort of have an extended liar paradox mm. so you mm. can you can extend this and uh, mm. depending on how you model it mm. this can give you extra degrees of freedom yeah um another is uh, a quick sales pitch for a philosopher from my country that uh, mm. never got uh, proper recognition his name is uh, Lautzen Brauer he lived in the late 19th early 20th century and uh, his realization was that uh, the five axioms of Aristotelian logic are just that well not his realization we know that from Agrippa's trilemma Munchausen's uh, trilemma logic cannot be used to validate logic without mm. running into circular reason. In other words, the axioms of logic are, are arbitrary. The only thing they have going for them is that we think they are self-evidently true. And when we apply them, them empirically, most of the time they work. Not always. Quantum mechanics comes in here and tells us that it's not always the, the case. But um, Brouwer, he figured that um, the law of excluded middle uh, which is one of the five axioms. It's, it's the axiom that says every statement is either true or false, not both and not neither. Um, and he decided to get rid of this axiom and see if we could construct a coherent logic, mm -hmm. uh, operationally applicable and coherent, internally consistent logic without that axiom. And lo and behold, we can. And in some applications, it's much more reasonable than Aristotelian logic. He called it intuitionist logic. Um, cool. And, and exam let me give you just a quick example of one case in which it's very uh, compelling that it's a better logic um, in mathematics and therefore by implication in physics and the other natural sciences. Um, you can, because of the law of excluded middle, you can prove that something exists by proving that it cannot not exist. And that allows you to prove that something exists without ever being able to conceive of an example of it. Mm. An example, a simple example of that which you have just prove, proven that it exists. And, and under intuitionist logic, this doesn't work because you don't have the law of excluded middle. So to prove that something exists, you have to produce one example. Mm. And that is much more empirically intuitive, right? Because how can you prove that something exists if you can't even give me a, or conceive of an example? T tell me what it is that, you're, that you have proven to exist. And you can't even say that. You can't even tell me that. So I, um, you wouldn't get the oscillations from that. Because to get the oscillations, you, you don't have fixed uh, uh, truth values, but you're still using the law of excluded middle. Um, but you could get some you could get some other quite interesting uh, dynamics. 
Mm. And some people, some people have uh, speculated about whether something like this, intuitionist logic, would be a better path for us to make sense of the so-called high strangeness phenomena, some psychological phenomena that are weirder than dreams. Um, and, and yet people report it, so it's a it's a phenomenal reality and stuff that people experience. So how is their mind operating to produce high strangeness phenomena? Or how is the mind of nature operating to produce high strangeness phenomena? And the hypothesis I, I raised was um, it is not using the law of excluded middle. Mm -hmm. that's, that's monkey logic. It's not <laughs> nature's logic. Um, anyway, just wanted to... To put it out there, Lauten mm. Brauer is the name of the yeah. guy that should be as well known as Spinoza, but unfortunately he isn't. He had some other weird thinking about social issues that maybe is the reason that he would never be popular in the world today, but uh, he had some very interesting ideas. Mm. Yeah, super cool. Thanks. Uh, that's 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 great. I, I I was aware of intuitionism, but I didn't connect it to this uh, to this uh, uh, grim stuff. So that's that's very good. I yeah. just wrote his name on the chat, so people awesome. because uh, yeah. if people would not know how to write down Louts and Brower, so I just uh, I just put it there uh, in That's the chat. That's very good. Can... That's very good. Um, well, you know, one is I'll 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 definitely uh, think about that. That's ex excellent. Uh, and you know, another thing we we started to think about is is enabling. I mean, this is some steps down, but enabling some of the again. Again, I I'm really I'm really interested in this this notion of um as uh, William James once said that um. Uh, thoughts are the thinker, you know, and this idea of active data and 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 sort of erasing the distinction between passive data that and and uh, in the context of this thing we were just talking about, you could imagine that some of the sentences contain um, elements that actually modify the sentences. So you could imagine, right, a self-referential kind of thing where there are certain atoms that actually go and cut out pieces from another sentence or alter, edit it, you know, some sort of string rewriting rules or something like that, right? So you can imagine, but 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 the other thing about that is to go back to because I think I forgot to mention this in the in the business about memories. If if the job if 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 what the uh, the system wants to do is remap engrams and other pieces of information that it got from its past self or from whoever into the new context, you could imagine that the the engrams themselves might be active. In other words, they don't have to be completely passive. They could also, there might be some advantages to them to be picked up and nourished. You know, maybe they're just passive molecules, but maybe they're maybe they're not molecules. Maybe they're um, vibration cycles, or maybe they're right some kind of uh, some kind of oscillation patterns that actually can be fed by appropriate resonance with with the cognitive system that they're going into. And so maybe they can actually. Uh, increase the likelihood that they get picked up and reproduced or or something by by uh, dynamics that they do right so so they don't have to be passive entirely so and so I'm also also kind of uh, fooling around with some with some models like that of 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 memories as uh, self reproducing patterns that have their own little tiny agendas and maybe it's as dumb as as persist you know that may be the simplest thing but maybe it's something else maybe it's um, more than persist maybe it's uh, you know, kind of like uh, individual neurons like to have a job, you know, they like to connect to circuits where they're actually going to going to do something. And so maybe these things too, maybe, you know, maybe their primary um, driver is to be uh, to be remapped and in, in the new in their new context and not be wiped out, which kind of gets to this uh, kind of basic philosophical thing, which is, you know, the some um, things called Bates Bateson's paradox, this idea that if you're a species, Right, you you have a choice. If you don't change with the environment, you're going to die out. Right, you're gonna you're gonna be go extinct. But if you do change, well, you're also kind of gone because you're not the same anymore. Right. So so what do you do? And I think that yes, that's the case for that. That's a dilemma that that is uh, is a problem for evolutionary lineages. Uh, either way, you're not going to persist as that uh, same thing. But it's also, I think, a problem for any kind of cognitive agent because. If you really are intent on not changing and persisting as you are, then you can't learn, you can't modify yourself, uh, you can't improve, you can't, you know, you can't uh, make any changes in light of further experience. You know that the most profound experiences are going to change you in some way. You're just not, whether it's, you know, the mechanics of, of metamorphosis or puberty or whether it's learning and you're just not going to be the same. And so committing to this idea that whatever persists, it's not going to be a thing, it's going to be a pattern and 
then 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 it makes sense then you can be an evolutionary lineage that that changes over time and and then you can be a a human or or any other kind of creature where your cells and, and the molecules in your brain go in and out and and changes come but you're still the same not because you're the same thing but because you have an extended cognitive history that that ties it all together so um yeah um, um uh, amir just a uh, a quick point. I wanted to ask Michael a simple yes or no question about an earlier yeah. topic before he, he leaves. So if I have 30 yeah. seconds and Michael to yeah. uh, the end, uh, sure. it's a quick question just for me to understand better. Oh, where do you want to do it now? Uh, it, it's a different, it's the earlier topic about things. Uh, we, we can do it quickly, uh, Michael. Yeah, it's, it's just from my understanding and maybe the understanding of the people here. Um, when you said we have to be open from multiple points of views, I, I'll talk about point of points of view as things. Uh, if there are things, then it, then a thing has its point of view. Uh, if I if we don't have any criteria for telling what is a valid thing and what is not, then we have an exponential explosion of the combinations, the per permutations of the states of nature. All of these combinations and permutations can be things, and they partly overlap. So it would have an exponential explosion, explosion of things and points of view. Uh, is that what you are open to? Or do you think there actually is a criterion for telling what is a thing and what is not? It's just that we don't know what it is, and it may not be the same thing as life. Mm. Uh, I I think there is a criterion, but I think that criterion is different from forever. So, so I, I apologize in advance. This is not going to be satisfying, but but this is what I think. Uh, I think that the criterion is from the perspective of each uh, each, um, each, in, each each agent. In other words, I, I think that the universe is probably infinite, but 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 certainly and uh, you know a hyper astronomical number of perspectives and of uh, of beings. And from the perspective of each one of those beings, uh, a different set of things are things and a different set are not things. And so, so yes, they're absolutely. And the criterion is, again, from the perspective of each observer, the, the criterion from the perspective of that, of that observer is, does it help sense making? Does it, does, it, it, does it give me a greater purchase on the world, both in practical terms, but also internally, uh, right, in my own sense making, however humble that or primitive that might be for simple agents. Um, but, but that's right. So, so you can ask any, if provided you know how to communicate with it, so we do okay, left hemisphere to left hemisphere, we're working on ways to ask your liver questions, like quite literally we're asking, for, we're, we're now trying to develop some technology to communicate with various other very unconventional agents. And from those kind of agents, um, uh, you will get a different uh, uh, set of what do I consider to be things, right? So, so, so your liver will have all kinds of comments about persistent physiological states as things, and we will look at those and say, "No, nah, that's that, that's I don't care about that. That's not a thing." IIT also takes this perspective that uh, the criteria is based on the perspective of the thing. It's it's the first person perspective of the mm -hmm. thing, but IIT would say. The criteria is to maximize integrated information. Whatever partitioning maximizes information integration, that determines what are the things. And but what you're saying is, is to maximize sense making. That's where you depart from IIT. Instead of maximizing integrated information, you maximize sense making. There should be a way to to formalize this. Um, I I I really think you and Julia would make a an, a, an exquisite pair. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah, it's it's been a while actually. I, I we used to um we used to meet up at the um uh, at some Templeton meetings that they used to have at the Arizona at the oh, ASU. Man. So it's been a while since I've seen him. So I will I will talk to him again. I think, but um no, you're right, and I and I think that uh, I if, if, the, you know the phi and and things like that are a pretty good. I mean, I, I call it sense making, but of course, I, I don't have a formula that you can that you can calculate. IAT is almost a formula you can calculate, and certainly there are uh, surrogate metrics that you actually can calculate. So that so it has that that benefit um, of it. But um, I am really interested in, and this is where some of the experimental stuff kind of leads into you know like bigger bigger issues. I'm I'm really interested in what an explanation is, 
and the idea that what we are looking for as beings, not just as scientists, but as beings, we are looking for uh, a better understanding of the world, not just looking backwards as far as explaining what just happened, not looking downwards as far as figuring out the particles or the components of, of whatever just happened, but actually looking forwards. In other words, I, I think a good explanation is a story about the world that helps you do the next good thing. In other words, it's something that it's looking forward. It's, 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 in, it's increasing insight. Not 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 a not a dissection of, of of what the hell just happened, but as as living agents, we have to live forward. We don't live backward um, the way that third person uh, descriptions of science can do. We have to decide what do I do next, and and these things are very complex. And uh, and as beings, what I like for um, from from explanations are something that raises my. Uh, sense making of the world such that I see, ah, well, given that now I can do this or now I should do this. And I think that is when I talk about sense making, that's what I mean. I mean that agents that have to um, actively engage with the world. And I don't mean the three dimensional world. I mean, whatever world they live in, it might be it's a physiological state space. It might be anatomical, whatever world they actually live in. Um, the fact that they have to engage with it is what makes them an observer. And this is like, we, you know, you mentioned like, well, maybe photographic film is an observer. Well, kind of, but a really tiny one because the photographic film is not going to do anything different based on what it sees on the film. At least the standard film doesn't do that, right? Whereas, whereas things that I would call a, a significant agent is something that takes observations and then the observations matter because it tries to fit them together into a compressed uh, representation of that helps it to know well what the hell do I do you know now after that and right and so and so that's why that's why I think that agents see things and they see other agents because if you don't do that it does not help you uh, understand the world you're living in and and as a practical matter you'll be dead in no time as a as a biological agent if you don't understand what what you're dealing with there is work in physics um, in foundations of physics um, that dovetails very well uh, mm. with, with your thoughts here. Um, Marcus Miller from the Austrian Academy of Sciences, uh, he, the way he frames physics is to ask the question, what will I see next? Mm. In other words, can I predict the states yeah. of the world? And yeah. all of physics can be rewritten in terms yeah. of this question, what will I see next? As opposed to under the assumption that there is a fixed world out there, which experiment is telling us, yeah. well, if there is such yeah. a world, it's not physical. Uh, unless you entertain all kinds of fantasies about, you know, uh, uh, multiverses and, and super mm. determinism, hidden variables. Um, but uh, if, if you could relate, what will I see next? to what should I do next, because what yes. you will do next must be informed by, by your ability to predict the world, what the world will do next. Exactly. Uh, there is a way to mathematically formalize this. Marcus has done it. Actually, Essential Foundation, we, we just got um, a, a researcher. We are, we are funding a researcher at the University of uh, Zurich in, in Switzerland uh, to do research on this so-called physics of first-person perspective. Yeah. Yeah, so you, that's, you that's need to, to, to start from scratch here. Yep. Yep. No, that's really great. And and the other and I wonder if I wonder if they talk to each other. I don't know. But um, Carl Friston and uh, and Chris Fields and Mark Solms and these, these are guys that I work with. They also work on exactly this. So so active inference and basically predicting your own next sensory states and how that um you know, they call it, I, th I think it's Carl's term, uh, the physics of sentience and the sentience of physics, right? So like, this is, you know, you guys, so I don't know, Amir, you guys, you guys might want um, to see if they can, they can show up at some point. There's some really interesting stuff. So hopefully they're talking to, to Miller and it's all kind of one thing, but I, I yes, I completely agree with you. Pre predicting what you are going to experience next is, uh, is, is, is a really fruitful um, yep. kind of uh, frame for this. I, I sent Marcus um, Carl's paper, published on um, the IEEE, one of the IEEE journals in 2013 or 14, uh, mm. about active inference. Mm. Um, but I, I didn't hear from Marcus back. The, the, the thing, I mean, I, I love the work of Carl Friston, by the way, but it's amazing how much resistance there mm. is to it because mm. people say, well, I can't understand it anyway, so why yeah. will I even try? Why yeah. will, I, yeah. will I even bother? Yeah. Uh, so Carl is not doing himself a favor yeah. <laughs> by his writing style. <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, he's a he's a he's an amazing genius, and and I, you know, I I sure sure as heck don't understand uh, all the math behind it, but I think the very simple. Um, so so there's one kind of slice of this which is just surprise minimization. Just 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 alone, this idea of surprise minimization is 
uh, is is really powerful, and you can apply it to all kinds of uh, scenarios, as, as as Carl has done from from ecosystems to psychiatry to whatever. Yeah. Um, we we had a project uh, recently that uh, it isn't published yet, but uh, another a grad student in my lab, um, um, uh, Franz uh, Quickling, is uh, he's looking at uh, surprise in yeast in um, sorry not yeast um, algae algae. So so believe it or not, algae can be surprised. And the reason that algae can be surprised is because they form expectations of what's going to happen next. And you can subvert those expectations and then they get stressed out and they're surprised. So uh, this, this kind of thing. And then, and then you know, Chris and, and uh, Chris Fields and then Carl can take it, you know, sort of much further down and look at symmetrical interactions between a system and its environment and, and who's learning about whom. And, you know, it turns out like both are learning about yeah. both, right? Michael, if, if you are, I mean, sorry, I'm taking too much of your time, but it, oh, go for it. here we may converge because... If you go for this, if you go for active inference, surprise minimization, which goes back to information theory, um, you will get Markov blankets, yeah, yeah, yeah. which means that you will get life. So it may, your criterion for determining what things are may actually be life if you pursue that consistently. Because in a Markov blankets, you get cell membranes, um, active inference, you have inner models. Uh, you know, the in, inner states can only communicate with external states or the other way around by proxy through the states of the Markov blanket. This is life. I, actually, Carl wrote a paper saying that this yes, is life. Did. Yeah, which which I'm 100% uh, on board with. Uh, that, that part is completely fine. I just think that if we um, take it seriously, I think we're going to be able to include in that umbrella with that exact same framework a bunch um, of stuff that any reasonable uh, biologist is going to say, well, I don't know what this is, but it isn't life. And, and I'm okay. I mean, I think what the move that you're making, and I would be perfectly comfortable with it, is to say, guys, you got the wrong definition of life. Th th this is what should be life, right? So, so I'm okay with that. But at that point, you know, it's, I don't know, the vocabulary, I'm, I'm kind of, yeah, less, less tied to it. Cool. Fantastic. Beautiful. Thank you. So, yeah, felt like... Um... Uh, a super amazing dialogue, which at points seemed to be in opposite direction and then ended up converging uh, very naturally, uh, which is very beautiful to see. I just want to say very quickly before you go, Michael, because I mentioned it last time, Douglas Harding. Um, but again, just another weird coincidence because he'd written this book on having no head, which you, which is the same title. He wrote that in 1961 mm. and it has the same title as a paper I think you co-authored. He also wrote a book called The Science of, Have of the First Person in 1974. Mm. So it felt like there's someone back there writing the titles of all these kind of uh, <laughs> new ideas from a very different perspective. He was kind of a, an architect and yeah. a mystic and a philosopher. Um, Excellent. Excellent. Anyway, maybe we'll bring someone along that that uh, kind of followed that work. Just, uh, I know we're over time for you, Michael, so just huge gratitude one more time. It's always fascinating. Oh, um, thank you so much. Yeah, yeah, it's just brilliant. And I um, hope you'll come back one day and then you mentioned several other people that uh, would be worth speaking to as well. So. Sure. Yeah, thank no, you, I absolutely Michael. will. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, yeah. And thank you, Bernard. It was awesome to uh, discuss all this with you, of course. Uh, yeah. Oh, just uh, to say quickly, everyone, we're staying on the call for a little while, Bernardo, because sometimes what happened last time when you left, a lot of people left not realizing and then we're like, oh, we didn't realize. The so yeah, carry on, Michael. We'll be here continuing for a little bit. But Michael, carry on with what you were saying. Cool. Yeah, no, sorry. I, I just, yeah, I was just uh, thanking you and thanking Bernardo because it's a, you know, a fascinating conversation as always. Um, I've taken a bunch of notes on some of the stuff you said, so. Very interesting. So yes, I look forward to uh, more uh, at any point. Sure. Exciting. Thank you so much. Take care. Mike. Thanks everybody. Appreciate it. <laughs>